So can you tell me a little bit about yourself and what you do? Uh, my name is Stephen Point, and I'm a member of the Skokale First Nation, Stella Nation, out at uh, Chilliwack. Um, currently the chair of the Minister's Advisory Committee for the Public Safety and Security of Vulnerable Women as of January of this year. Um, but I'm a lawyer and a judge by trade. What made you go into law? How did you decide that that was kind of what you wanted to do with your life? Oh, um, a couple of things. Uh, the, my mom was interested in me becoming a lawyer. And she the, uh, um, exercised a few strategies through that. But um, it was later on when I was the chief of my community, I became the chief at age 25 was working um, in about uh, the union of BC Union chiefs and attending meetings and whatnot and you know it became apparent that there was a pretty big need for trained individuals to know more about Canadian law and exactly what was going on so that's why I decided to go back into school. How did I meet Louise? Yeah. Louise, uh, um, when I uh, began working um, see what year was it now? I went to law school around 1982. So it was the late, it was the late 70s, early 80s when uh, I was working on the executive committee actually of the Union of Chiefs. I was a chief and then I became uh, elected to the executive board and um, about 1980 there was George Manuel was coming back from being the National Union Brotherhood chair, and he became the president of the Union of BC and Chiefs around 80, 81, that area. And he asked me to stay on to do work with him in, in fisheries and uh, to, to, to uh, I was researching in those days, worship, working with Rosie Tija in the research department. And um, Louise and Leslie were brought in. Louise, I think, was coming out of law school, it seems to me. She was very young. Uh, um, I shouldn't say really young, but she, she was younger. Um, her and Leslie were been hired to work for the Union of Chiefs, and that's, that's when I met her and Leslie. Um, yeah, they started working for George at the Union of BC Union Chiefs in those days. Can you talk a little bit about the work that you were doing with UBCIC at that time? And that's some of the work that you did with Louise as well. Oh yeah, well, you know, when you work for George uh, at the union office uh, in those days, you did everything. We used to, they had the old Gestetner machines, you know, they all twisted like this, uh, put the ink in, that was really messy. And we used to have to make the minutes for the meetings and, and the reports. So we used to draft up George's speeches and whatnot. And, People would come and they want to find documents, so we'd help them find documents in the resource center, uh, the band files and whatnot. There was a lot of Indian Affairs documents that we'd gotten uh, from Indian Affairs and microfiche, and so and we had the McKenna McBride commissioner for it, all divided up in different files, so bands could come in and look at their history of when they were created and where the reserves were and that sort of thing. So I was working in that general area. And of course, well, you're, there was many of us working in the office, so if you had to make photocopies, you made photocopies. If you had to make coffee, you made coffee. If you had to drive stuff all the way up to Kamloops, you did that. <laughs> so you just did whatever you were told. But uh, you had a job description, at least I thought, I think I did. I worked in research, but you did everything for the union. Um, and when Louise and Leslie came on board, I mean, they were doing they were doing law stuff. I mean, they were actually making applications to court and that sort of stuff. So I did in those days. I didn't really have a lot of interaction with them, and they they were coming in, and I certainly knew a lot of them and met them and had met Louise and 
and um, uh, it wasn't actually until I came back from law school that I articled with Louise and Leslie. They were they were in a separate office by them from the union, but they were still um, uh, connected to the union, didn't work for the union. So that's when I began to actually work with them after I came back and articled with them. So um, yeah, then I was in their office every day. What court cases were you working on? Oh, golly, uh, let's see. Um, I remember packing boxes in for her and Stuart in, uh, in the Derrickson case. Um, I think that was in, I think that was in Supreme Court. It was a fishing case, it seems to me. And that one went all, all the way up. And, and I was an artifact student, right? In, and uh, listening and making copies and doing these you know, told sort of thing and sitting in court and you know, getting messages, phoning people and doing the sort of thing that articling students do, right? Yeah, and it was always exciting working with uh, Louise and Lindsay. It was always a, a great uh, a learning experience, you know, to, to see Louise work. And I think she had, she had Max in those days, her first baby. She used to bring Max into court. I remember that. She was always like um, long hair, you know. I mean, I, when I moved to Vancouver to go to university in, in the early 70s, I was right out of high school, out of the farming community in Chilliwack. And in those days, Fourth Avenue was still strewn with uh, uh, all these uh, houses that had clothes hanging out the windows. And, sheets on the windows and flower children running all over the place, people with no shoes on, you know. And so I got right into it. I took my shoes off too. Heck, we never wore shoes at home anyway. And everybody hit me. It was really the end of the, the love hippie era, right? And Louise just looked like she had just sort of come from San Francisco, kind of <laughs> long dress, you know, printed dresses and sandals and and she'd have Max in tow, and as a baby, and she'd be going to court, and she had long hair. And, and um, yeah, she was really cool. She was really, really cool to, to be with and to talk with. And, yeah, she was interesting, and more than interesting. She was, she was really cool. <laughs> what are some of your fondest memories during that time of, with working as an art thing student for Louise? Oh, just sitting in on all the meetings with the different people and listening to them. Seems to me, um, gosh, we're talking a long time ago now, but um, I think at one point they realized that, you know, you're supposed to do wills in the States too, and they were running around trying to get me a will too, right? <laughs> and. Uh, I think they actually farmed me out to a different law firm to get me some different experience too. So that, because all they did was Aboriginal law, right? They didn't do anything else. And you're supposed to get experience in different areas. And so I, I ended up working in another, another office. I can't remember whose office it was to gain that experience, right? But, um, but L Leslie and Louise, I mean, Louise, they're just on the go all the time. And I remember, I remember Le Louise saying to me one morning, I get in, like I was coming in from Chilliwack on the bus every morning, and um, getting off the bus and getting to the office, and she said, Steve, you can't, you gotta go catch a plane, here's a ticket, she said. And I go, Louise, what's this? She says, you're gonna go up and do your first case today in Penticton. And I said, what kind of case is this? She says, a hunting case. She said, uh, it's, uh, it's an Aboriginal rights defense, there's going to be elders speaking in their language. There's going to be an interpreter. You're going to run the case through all the witnesses yourself. I go, by myself? You have to just over here's twenty dollars for the taxi. Get going. Your plane leaves in an hour. I have to get on a taxi. She paid for the taxi. I didn't have any clothes. I I, I flew all the way to Penticton. And, and who who met me at the airport? Was it Jennifer Jenny? writes the books now. Armstrong. Jeanette Armstrong. Jeanette Armstrong, right. 
And she met me at the airport and she said, are you the lawyer? I go, yeah, I'm the lawyer. And uh, no, she didn't meet me at the airport. No, I got all the way to the courthouse and I walked in and there's no judge. There's nobody. And I finally see some, this is, this is small town courthouse. And he was sweeping the floor. I said, where, where is everybody? I'm supposed to be doing a trial here. Oh, he says, are you Steve Point? I go, yeah. Oh, they're just waiting for you. They heard your plane was a little late, so they all went for coffee. <laughs> I was like, okay. So I go to coffee, and there's Jeanette Armstrong. She meets me there. And, and she introduces me to the, uh, to the uh, witnesses. This is a full-blown Aboriginal rights defense hunting case. Somebody who charged with hunting at night, you know. And Louise sends me up on my own as an article in suit to do it. She said, she said, don't get into your heart if you don't win this case. Okay, she says. <laughs> and, um, but it was a great experience. That's the kind of thing she used to do. You just say, go up and do it, you know. Just like, get up there on your feet, start uh, cross-examining witnesses and putting witnesses in and putting your evidence in and all that. So I did. And, um, after that, I was never ever afraid to appear in court. I mean, it was it was a great thing that you did for me, actually. <laughs> <laughs> well, we had lots of times with um, she'd be called to go to meetings uh, to give consultation. I went with her one time up to the Quick Satonic Band, and uh, Alice and Peter Smith. I remember Peter was the chief. You have to get there by a, a float plane or a boat way up in Guilford Island. Louise and I get there the day before, and we're, there's no hotels, you see. There's no um, phones. And at midnight, the lights go because the power goes out. The generator, they turn it off at midnight. And Louise and I were sleeping in, this, in, the, in the house. Somebody had given us a place to build it us out. And so the next day, I thought, well, we're gonna, they're going to start the negotiations. I'm just there as her article student. And Dr. O gets there. He, this is the guy that was the, uh, Owen Anderson was the uh, regional director of Indian Affairs. We used to call him Dr. O. I don't know why we call him Dr. O. But it seems to me that's what they call him. And he gets there with his plane. His plane is still running. It's like he's only going to be there for a few minutes. And <laughs> Alice Smith was the uh, was running the negotiations all about logging road behind the reserve and this company wanted access and Louise was there as the advisor. Alice said, you guys go to the store with Peter. Peter, take him to the store. So I get on a boat with Louise and I'm like, we go to the store? Is a store around here? <laughs> it took an hour and a half or something for the boat to get up there. And Louise is laying and sitting there in the sunshine and we're all going up the to get a, what, a bottle of pop or something at the store, and Peter checks his mail, you know, and we come all the way back, and Owen Anderson's plane is still running, and it's waiting for him to leave. And Al, that's when I learned about negotiations from this elder, uh, uh, Alice Smith. And it was a, a great time to s sit there and listen to Louise uh, eventually when we got into the whole road situation, and the maps and all that. And yeah, I, she just let me watch. And, see what they were doing. It was a great lesson for me, being in the community, watching how things were done. There's lots of times like that. <laughs> the Derrickson case, where were we? I think we were in, hmm, seems to me we were like Kamloops or something like that, Penticton maybe, fishing case. And her and Stuart were In the, in the trial, actually in the trial, and listening to them talk and listening to, the, to how they would prepare their factums and go over their factums and strike out phrases and underline stuff and say, I'm going to change this paragraph over here. I was looking at them and listening and, and then they turned around and they asked me something. I go, they're asking me. <laughs> and I remember. What they were talking, they were talking about regulations and that impact on Aboriginal titles. So I gave them my, my views on that. They they took that. They put that into their factum. I was going, oh, 
I just contributed something to this case. <laughs> but they weren't, they never, uh, she never treated you like you were so, like something less than her. She was always, she always treated you right, treated you good. You felt like a part of the team. And, you know, it was like, it was really good, good learning from her, being with her. Yeah. I was trying to think of the words that describe some of the way she used to be in court. She's always intense in court. Right? She's smart, smart lady. You didn't get much by her. And she was always intense and stare right at you and, you know, it was like put you on the spot. Boy, I wouldn't want to be a judge and, and, and I was a judge once when she was in court. But she was, she was very smart and, uh, and uh, but intense is the word I'd use to describe the way she was. But she was always um, very um, nice to people, nice to people that she worked with. Um, yeah, I used to like being with her, traveling with her, learning from her, watching, watching the way she did things. Yeah, it was great. Great experience as an article student. Couldn't, couldn't have done a better article section. I had actually been invited to interview with Bullhauser and Tucker. When I left law school, I got a letter asking for to go down for an interview. I assume students must have got letters like that. I don't know. But um, I didn't even know who Bullhauser and Tupper was. And they said, well, it's a pretty big firm in town. And, and I looked at it and I went, no, I'm arguing with Louise Mandel. Because <laughs> I'd already arranged it. You know, I'd already asked them. They said, sure, when you get to finish law school, you come here. And I think I was one of their first students. I don't know if I was their first student, but I think I was pretty near the beginning. And. So I was thinking I was going to get a t-shirt that said, I turned down Bullhauser and Tupper for Louise Mandel. <laughs> you know, that's a lot of great memories. A lot of great memories with Louise. I working, working with her later on, when I was actually in my own law practice, she used to help me throw work my way or send people my way because they had too much to do. I mean, Mendel Pinder, they just, they're awesome, awesome busy, right? And I remember one year, when was it? Her and Michael Jackson phoned me up. He said, Steve, you got to come down. We, we need you to to, uh, to to help us on this intervene, intervener status. And I go, well, what do you want me to do? They said, we want you to represent the Union of BC and Chiefs on the intervention. And the Delgamo case. The Delgamo case? Where at? <laughs> at the BC Court of Appeal. I go, I don't, I've never done any work at the BC Court. No worry, we'll write your factum for you. <laughs> we just want you to bring it in and talk to us. You and Rini Taylor. So Rini was a colleague of mine. She was working at the university. So Rini and I looked at her and said, oh my God, what are they getting us into, right? And so we went down to the Union of Chiefs office one night. And there was, there was Michael, and there was Louise. I'm sure Chloe was there. Some of the staff was still there. And they showed us how to put a fact together for the Court of Appeal. It was just amazing. We did it. I think, I don't know how late we worked. It was pretty darn late. It was early morning. We were finally finished. But, uh, yeah, just in, in, within a few hours, we had a fact together. That it was, and I still have it. I kept it. Just as a souvenir, <laughs> and then and then Rini Taylor went in, and I went into BC Court of Appeal and spoke to. You know, sometimes the Court of Appeal don't want to hear from you, right? They just read your fact and say, because the Union of Chiefs have gotten intervener status, and they wanted to raise the issue of sovereignty uh, as as a perspective for the for the, uh, uh, the test that they were raising. So I said, okay, we'll do it. So. There I was, standing up on my back legs, speaking in the Court of Appeal, in the Delgamo case. That's my claim to fame for the Delgamo case. That's it. <laughs> but Louise and my and I, watching them do it, I mean, I, it was a great experience and learned an awful lot. But I was, I was basically doing, I mean, just starting my practice in Cholak and doing smaller criminal law cases. And 
Well, the one case that I did work on with Louise was the Vanderbeek case. Dorothy Vanderbeek was charged with 10 fish, selling 10 fish on Chilliwack. And I was doing it was a legal aid case. And one of the elders was picking me up at home and bringing me down to the case in Surrey every day. We'd buy those little sandwiches for lunch all, uh, and, and eat soup for, for, for lunch uh, with, with Dorothy. We picked Dorothy up first, then bring her down to the case. And uh, uh, Francis Phillips would drive me down every day. And uh, I did all the witnesses, the uh, cross examined all the witnesses the Crown had in trial. And then Louise took it over on uh, up to county court. And uh, I went to the Supreme Court of Canada. But I did do the trial of the Vanderby case with Louise's direction and guidance, you know, do this, do that, okay, okay, so, and so we got, we, we got everything in that we, you know, we thought was pertinent so that the trial, the appeal would work out well, so, and it did, it went all the way to the Supreme Court of Canada, so, that's another one, hey, I worked on that case, um, as a lawyer, so that was very cool, very cool, <laughs> anyway, so yeah, she was very, very um, a great teacher and a great person to be with. <laughs> How much did your views on Aboriginal law and the role that lawyers play um, in gaining Aboriginal rights and title, how much did that change in your time working for Louise? Well, was and is I mean she's she's a bright lady right and discipline is another word that I would use right she's um, she sets a high standard and that helps when you're a student um, creating arguments building your arguments able to rationalize and think on your feet, right? And so when, when, as a politician, when you're going into the whole area of Aboriginal title and rights, you know, I mean, the chiefs, I think, um, understand what their rights are. They say, you know, we have a right to go fishing, we have a right to go hunting, we have, you know, we own our land and all that. But then when he crossed that threshold into law, you know, you go on the other side of the bar sort of thing, uh, and, and, and you begin to read the cases, and um, you begin to understand the, the constitutional framework that we're operating on. You begin to understand the, the difficulty then that the lawyers have in actually um, bringing the political positions that come from the chiefs and, and, and taking those and flipping them into the law, right, making them into something that, that um, um, fits within the Canadian legal system so that arguments can be made, right. And that's not an easy thing to do sometimes because, um, you know, a lot of what chiefs and what, what I understood when I went in is, is based on the notion of sovereignty, both based on the notion of of, of lock, stock, and barrel, the old Jaws, James Gosnell position. And when lawyers get that, they've got to somehow go, well, we still have a constitution, you know, we're still within the courts of Canada, we're not arguing outside of Canada, so how do we make those arguments? And, and that's the, 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 the part that I think is, is, is not easy to do. And, and then to, to once you've built those arguments, and, and you're going in and saying, well, this is what we can accomplish, and, then to go back and try to explain that, you know, to the to the to the chiefs, and that's not easy as well, you know. And but Louise wrote some great great memos, and I've kept most of them. I sort of have my Louise Mandel collection, right? And um, and she's got a um, she's developed a great uh, way of communicating and helping people to better understand, you know. So. Um, I would say that entirely all of my views with regard to Aboriginal title have been shaped by, by her and what she's done. You know. um, 
because when I read her material, it makes sense to me. And, and it's, it's because I grew up understanding, listening to what she had to say. Her and people like Michael Jackson, Leslie Pinder, you know, they, you, you just, so I'm kind of a product of, I guess, you know. And so, um, yeah, and, and it's not that other people don't make any sense, but uh, what rings true to me, what sounds right to me is when, when I read her material. I guess I'm biased in that regard. <laughs> Admit it. <laughs> Guilty. <laughs> how did being a chief before you went into becoming a lawyer, how did that help you recognize how to kind of frame Aboriginal rights and title then in front of a court? Or did it? Well, being, being on council, I was on council for seven years before I went into law school. And um, I remember going into my first union of chiefs meeting. Where was it? Gee whiz. It was, it was actually up in Prince George. I went with my chief in those days. And I slept on the floor in his room. Um, I had to attend for some other reason because I was a student here at uh, university. 1970, I think, 69, 70, and was it 1971? Yeah, I think it was 1971, because it was the centennial of BC joining Confederation, 1871, and um, I think I'd gotten a grant with, with Ernie Philp to, to do some cultural presentations during the summer months in the north, and we went to the Union of Chiefs meeting to sort of ask them for support because we're going to have to go into all these communities in the north. And that's when I first went to my fir first Union of BC and Chiefs meeting and listening to the speeches and hearing the uh, a lot of the older chiefs get up and talk. And when I became a chief myself and, and listening to the, uh, the legal reports, listening to the accountant's reports, um, I realized that I didn't understand everything they were saying. I mean, I didn't even know what questions to ask to help me to figure out how to clarify what I didn't understand. The problem was I just didn't understand what they were saying at all. So I remember getting up to the microphone and saying that, you know, gee, I don't understand. <laughs> Philip Paul was, I think, chairing the meeting, was looking at me, and the lawyer was sitting there, and the lawyer was sitting there with a three-piece suit on there. And so giving his report about what they were doing. And I was going, I was looking at the room and people were like, you know, I think none of these guys understand either. <laughs> and uh, some of the other chiefs were kind of I'm glad you said that. I didn't understand what the guy was talking about either. <laughs> you know, and, and um, so when I got into, uh, into practice, I got into um, working with uh, Louise and whatnot. I was always concerned about that, making sure that people kind of understood why we were doing what we were doing and how that how that was um, consistent with the positions that were being taken by the union. And um, and, and in those days, I mean, um, you had the declarations that the chiefs were making. Um, this whole movement towards towards sovereignty started coming out in the 70s and 80s. And partly that was because of the work that Rosie Tiji and I were doing uh, in, in the resource center when the Yukon Agreement was coming out. And I remember Mike Smith, who was chair, uh, Joe, no, John Joe was, I think. Was it John Joe? In the Yukon where negotiating the, the uh, trees up there. And I remember George was going to go up and talk with George was uh, George Manuel. And we pulled him aside and we said, you know, these guys are going up there and they are willing to settle this whole issue of land claims on the basis of fee simple. Do you know what fee simple is? And George said, no, what does fee simple mean? I go, well, fee simple is the same title that the white people have. I don't think that's what we say when we own the land. And, and uh, so he went up there and started ringing this bell about 
no, you guys are selling short, don't do this, they stopped the treaty. You know, it's like, everything went, it seemed to me they, they sort of took a hiccup there because Rosalie and I had gone in and did that. And, and um, so the problem, of course, is, is that when, when we began to shape these arguments around sovereignty, this, this whole notion that Aboriginal title means uh, entire lock, stock, and barrel ownership. In the court of law, we didn't realize that you can't raise those arguments, right? <laughs> this is within Canada. I mean, of course, it's no longer have jurisdiction if you begin to tell them that they don't have jurisdiction. It's like, <laughs> okay. <laughs> so having that experience as, as a chief and understanding the positions that they were taking, right? Then um, I think I think that helped me to, to go back and say, okay, this is our issue. This is what we can do with the law. You can begin to protect some of these rights. But you guys need to start fleshing them out in treaties. You need to go back and begin to work them out in a different way. You know, the law can do this much for you, but it's not going to solve everything. So that helped me being in coming from being a chief and being in the community with the people, right? And, and sort of stepping into the shoes as, as a lawyer going, oh, golly, now how do we do this? <laughs> um, so, yeah, it, that was, it was, it was an interesting transition anyway, to say the least. It was pretty interesting. And Louise was a good guy for that because, um, you know, Every year she would make the reports to the unions, the union chiefs, and, and go and explain. And one of the other uh, words for Louise is, is talk fast. She talks very fast. And, and the reason she talks fast is because her mind works that quickly, right? She's just very, very quick. And in order to keep up with her thoughts, she, she talks fast, you know. And, and, uh, and she has compressed thinking. She was very... Um, complex uh, thinking and so often if you don't if you had, if you don't have the background to understand you know you do get left behind a little bit so uh, but she got better and better at, at doing that you know uh, speaking to the, to the chiefs and helping them understand what, what we were doing what the lawyers were doing and, and you know she got a lot of support she, she got a lot of victories too for the chiefs a lot of great, great things in court to protect rights, and so, yeah, uh, her reputation was pretty stellar in terms of, you know, standing up in court and fighting for the rights and whatnot, and, you know, I, I think, I think uh, there's a lot of aversion, um, uh, lawyers, with lawyers who work for aboriginal people, right, through the years. She's in that long line of people who come to the defense of Aboriginal people. I've done a great job. Yeah. That's a great thing to, to be actually be able to learn from her too. To work with her. Yeah. <laughs> um, so how did then transitioning to becoming a judge from a lawyer? Again, like how did being a lawyer then like transfer being a lawyer and working with Louise and transfer into understanding law and from kind of the judge perspective? Well, the, the making the transition to the judge, I think, was, wasn't that easy for me because the, um, being a judge, of course, you're nonpartisan, right? You're supposed to be quiet and uh, patient and um, and you allow the lawyers to bring positions to you in this adversarial process called trial. 